Hello and welcome to episode 117. Got to double check that. Yeah, episode 117 of the Chills of Will podcast. It's a pleasure today to be joined by S.J. Sindhu. Who is she? She is a Tamil diaspora author of two literary novels, two hybrid chapbooks, and a forthcoming graphic novel. Her first novel, Marriage of a Thousand Lives, won the Publishing Triangle Edmund White Award. That's a mouthful. And was a Stonewall <laughs> Honor book and a finalist for a Lambda Literary Award. Sindhu's second novel, Blue Skin Gods, will be published, has been published. It's published in 2021, November by Soho Press. Graphic novel, Shakti, and she'll be telling us about another one, is Shakti is forthcoming from HarperCollins. Sindhu's hybrid fiction and nonfiction chapbook called I Once Met You But You Were Dead, what a title, won the Turnbuckle <laughs> Chapbook Contest and was published by Slip Lip Press. And her hybrid nonfiction and poetry chapbook, Dominant Genes, won the Black River Chapbook Competition and will be published, has been published? Yeah. February 2022. That's right. Yes, yes, yes. By Black Lawrence Press, which is a friend of the podcast. A 2013 Lambda Literary Fellow, Sindhu holds an MA in English from the University of Nebraska-Lincoln and a PhD in English in creative writing from Florida State University. Sindhu teaches at the University of Toronto, Scarborough. Dr. Sindhu, what a pleasure to have you. How are you today? Thank you for having me. I am great. Awesome. How did we do on, how did I do on the bio? I know some of the, I, I corrected some of the, the some of the, the dates and stuff, but you are just yeah. too, too dang prolific. That's, that's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Uh, well, obviously a very um, accomplished career with much to come in the future. I'd love to know how it kind of began. Um, your upbringing, you know, what were you reading? Were you the the library kid were you um you know was it oral stories mixed with the reading like was it a print rich environment in your home how how did that work with with reading and and, and writing in your especially in your younger days i was totally the library kid um mm -hmm. i i moved to the u.s when i was seven from okay. sri lanka i didn't know english and so my parents were like okay uh we moved in may at the mm -hmm. end of May. So I had the entire summer to basically learn English before I started third grade. No big, no, and no pressure, they were no like, pressure. right. They were like, uh, how do we do this? So they got me, um, they got me cable and like fancy cable. <laughs> we had the Ooh. Disney channel yes. and which was like a big deal mm -hmm. then. Um, so I basically watched the Disney channel and spent my time in the library trying to teach myself English uh -huh. um and sort of worked I guess uh, <laughs> I when I started that. school yeah I started school in the fall uh, I was in ESL classes for you know a few years and and I had um it took them I think a whole semester to find me an interpreter mm. so for a semester I was just sort of like floundering around and my only ways of really learning the language um, besides just sitting in class uh, was, you know, talking to other kids, which I didn't really like to do because I was an introvert, um, reading <laughs> books in the library, and then uh, watching Disney Channel and Cartoon Network. So yeah. that's essentially what I did. <laughs> and, um, and so, you know, my, my, my knowledge of English is very much tied to stories and mm -hmm. um, storytelling. And so I started out, you know, at the very low end of the library, the picture books, the sort of children's um, sections. And then I very quickly sort of advanced um, to, you know, chapter books. And then soon I was reading adult novels because I, I thought they were more interesting than than what the uh, what the kid lit of the mm -hmm. '90s offered, mm -hmm. um, which was not you know kid lit nowadays is amazing and yes. offers yes. so much more. Yes. But kid lit of the '90s was not very uh, diverse or mm. edgy in any way, right? It was very right. safe. So so I was I was reading a lot of adult novels at that at that time. Um, and I fell in love with Harry Potter, which, you know, mm -hmm. saying it now is sort of like, 
there's, you know, there's political implications with that. And, and I do not condone J.K. Rowling or anything that she believes in terms of trans people. Um, but at that time, that's what I was in love with. I was in mm -hmm. love with Harry Potter mm -hmm. and I wrote a lot of nonfiction in high school. Mm -hmm. um, that was sort of my beginning with mm -hmm. writing. Wow. Um, I wrote a ton of fan fiction and one of my fan fiction stories became really popular on live journal <laughs> back when, live back journal. when, yeah. yeah, back when live journal was a thing. Uh -huh. It, um, you know, people would, would email me and be like, can you, are you going to, are you going to release the next chapter of this thing? Uh. And, um, it was a wolf star story, which, uh, is like a, a romance between, um, Sirius Black and Remus Lupin in, in the Harry Potter universe. And, oh. um, and I got my first taste of what, a, what having an audience felt like okay. and having a, having a sort of audience that's sort of waiting for your next release feels yeah. like. And I got really kind of addicted. And um, yeah. when I, I started college as a computer science major, but I started taking creative writing classes and sure. there was no going back after that. Yeah. Like, and uh, since, yeah, since I took my first creative writing uh, class in college, I've been sort of tunnel visioned. Like yeah. I knew what I wanted to do and um, there was nothing that was going to stop me really. Oh man. Well, so, okay. So, so what, what was on the Disney channel in those days? I'm trying to think oh. like that's before like Raven, I guess probably. Right. Like, Let's be. Ah, uh, there was some. I, I okay. remember that's a Raven, but I think I was yeah. a little bit older. Okay. Uh, I think it was like Lizzie McGuire was on. Yeah. Okay. okay. Maybe. I think I still think I was a little bit older. Sure. Uh, the first thing I remember watching is a rerun of The Lion King, and I think it was around that time. It was like ninety four, ninety five, when like The yes. Lion King was being screened yes. on yes. on TV. Yes. Um, yeah, that's that's the first thing I remember watching. And I was like, I was so bored because I didn't know what was going on and I couldn't understand any of the English. <laughs> and I was just like, what is happening? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Well, you have no way of knowing, but um, that's a little traumatic for me, The Lion King, because I lost the uh, school. I was supposed to I was running for school president and the movie had just come out. And my my uh, opponent, who later won, she used Hakuna Matata as her slogan. Wow. Which is a great, I mean, great call on her part. And she was a great president. <laughs> so no hard feelings, no hard feelings. But, uh, but yeah. <laughs> um, I, I, I don't know much about the, fa the fan fiction world. Like, I mean, were you, did you write like 20 installments or like two? Like how did, and then with that, like you said, you know, you got addicted to the audience and you, you learned what it was to have an audience waiting. Like, did you see yourself like tailoring your work towards what they wanted what the masses wanted um no I was I, like that is something that I'm really grateful for is that I was never really tempted um to ever you, tailor you my work out. to what they wanted out. yeah <laughs> yeah I I just I just I was like okay I'm gonna write what I want to write and mm -hmm. um some of the stuff really landed and some of it didn't uh I think I wrote like I, I released it chapter by chapter Mm -hmm. and it was like an alternate universe retelling of the marauders time oh. um yeah it, it 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 i i think i had like tw yeah 20 or so chapters okay. and i was only halfway through before i stopped <laughs> um i just sort of abandoned it because i i was getting serious about my writing in college and i was like sure. I, you know once i went to college and I started actually making friends and actually like going to parties and stuff. I, I completely <laughs> stopped uh, updating yeah. my fan fiction. <laughs> right. What else does it, I mean, is it, is, is the fan fiction in the ether now or what could one find that? One could, um, I, I wrote under a pseudonym, which I'm really glad I did. I okay. don't, I think only one person has ever found it. Whoa. And that person like told me what, like how they found it and they were like you should probably get rid of this last bit uh, if you never want somebody to find this and I was like thank you 
<laughs> and I got rid of it. And now I don't think anyone will find it. <laughs> wow. Okay. Wow. Dang. You, you would have been great at computer science apparently then too. Jeez. Man, with those, <laughs> with those skills, with those skills. I wonder about, um, about Tamil, the language, was Tamil your first language? Yes. Yes. You know, I mean, do, does, is the language, what stands out about Tamil maybe that helped you to become a great writer? Is it, you know, is it lyrical? Is it rep repetitive is not the term, but you know, is there something, are there things about the language specifically that, that lend themselves to writing or to, or that even connect to English? I don't know. Um, it's not connected to English at all, but it is a very lyrical language. Mm -hmm. I think um, to me, it's a super hard language to learn because there are so many ways of saying the same thing. Mm -hmm. And, um, and each word has like, you know, five different connotations. And mm -hmm. I really like everything that is written in Tamil, like Tamil lyrics, Tamil um, poetry. It's, it, it is very beautiful to listen to if you mm -hmm. know what, you know, if you can understand the language. Yeah. And even if you can't, um, it, the, the words themselves are really beautiful mm. um, in how they sound. And so I, I think, you know, I grew up watching Tamil movies, um, mm. which are a lot like Bollywood movies. Um, mm. And they have songs and they have these, you know, these super dramatic sort of mm. uh, arcs and, um, and and the Tamil language itself in the in the lyrics of the songs are I don't know I, I just I, I think it lends itself to the poetry really well. Mm -hmm. um, and then so uh, I was gonna ask you a follow up about that. You talked about it being lyrical. Oh yeah, so it's like it's almost like like a built in thesaurus, right? You're saying there are like five different ways they they mean different connotations you know how, excuse me you know how like in german they have those compound words <clears throat> excuse me oh yes right that are so ultra specific i feel like maybe it's kind of like that but that's interesting you said so so the connotations are different right and i guess even like the way you say something could mean that it's sarcastic versus serious i gotta think that that made you yeah quite a quite a writer because it's just like okay being very precise with your language Right. Yeah, it's, 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 we don't have a lot of compound words, but we do have a lot of like, um, like many different words that mean similar things, but okay. very, very slightly different. Uh -huh. Like, um, like, uh, the word alupu is like, it's not quite restlessness. It's not mm. quite boredom. Mm. It's not quite ennui, but it's like uh, somewhere in there. Uh. And it's like there, there's different ways of um, of describing words, like you know, and and I talk about this in the novel. Words like love um, have many, many different words uh, for all the different yes, kinds yes, of yes, love yes, that yes, you can yes, possibly right. feel. Mm -hmm. um, so, so it's it's you know, it's a very precise language. Oh, that was a great really part of the book. Appreciate. That was a great part of the book. Was that was that when the main character was still in in India, or was that when he moved to the state? That was when he um, finds his birth mother, and yes. he's sort of like ruminating uh -huh. on on the uh -huh. on the on the language and the word mother itself, and and right. you know, like figuring out, trying to figure out how to call, like what to call her. Uh huh. Even as even right, even that word being used like as a verb. That that scene, and we'll get to the book in a little bit, but that scene is uh, is so good because it's not because like the lack of pop, the lack of emotion, right? It's it's not some Disney, you know. Oh, hey, mom, I miss you all these years. It's it's realistic. It seems like, right? I mean, there's just so many barriers between them. Or I don't know, if barriers is the word, but but yes, yeah, it's, it's not a love or hatred. It's just kind of a eh, <laughs> right? Um, and so you know, your the the book um blue skin gods takes place in the state of tamil nadu am i pronouncing that correctly mm -hmm. okay. what, what is the connection between you know that, that's the southernmost state of india connection between that and and the tamil people so the tamil tamil as an ethnic group right 
is there a huge distinction between the Tamils of Sri Lanka and the Tamils of, of India? Is there sort of camaraderie in a, in a brotherhood or is it? There is. Um, and, and, you know, the, the actual, like, sea space between Tamil Nadu and, and the northern tip of Sri Lanka is actually very small. Mm -hmm. um, like, you can make that journey in a canoe if you wanted. Like, oh, you know, yeah. it's very, very small. Uh -huh. um, it's not easy to make it in a canoe but people do people have yeah have done it with robots before mm. so it's it's actually very small and there's been you know um evidence of migration mm. you know back and forth over mm. thousands of years uh but the fact that um the northern sort of Tamil population of sri lanka has been isolated Mm -hmm. um, fairly isolated from Tamil Nadu for so long means that our dialect is different. Right, so right, our, right. our language has sort of shifted and, and mm -hmm. grown apart. We're still speaking Tamil and we can still sort of understand each other, but Sri Lankans, uh, Sri Lankan Tamils speak a, 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 I guess, a more archaic version of mm, the language. Yeah. We, we, our, our intonation, our cadences, our, our pronunciation is much more um, classical. Right, right. And Tamil Nadu, Tamils tend to have a lot more slang, a lot mm. more, um, they have a sort of drawl that is sort mm. of like a Texan drawl with <laughs> English. They like, they like squeeze out the vowels a little bit and okay. they like draw them out. And it's, uh, it's really interesting to me. Wow. Um, and they, and they have uh, like, we'll have two different words that we use for the same thing. Sure. Um, so that's, that's, it's really interesting to, to compare. Um, but I think, you know, Tamil movies used Indian Tamil. And okay. so like, I feel like, Sri Lankans can often understand Indian Tamil, but uh, Indians often can't understand the other way around. Sri Lankan yeah. Tamil. Yeah, because uh, because ours is a little bit more classical and a little bit closer to written, like formal Tamil. Okay. So again, the language hipsters, right? You yes. <laughs> <laughs> I was that's, yeah, that's so interesting, right? Like like this idea of like a, almost like a preserved language. Yeah. You know, like the like the Turkish Cypriots on the, you know, the island of, of Cyprus, mm -hmm. right? They're maybe speaking a, the original Turkish maybe, or, you know, mm -hmm. that hasn't, uh, or, you know, like, like Albanians in Italy and you know, you know, all over the world. That's so interesting. Wow. Um, go back to what you were reading as a kid, Harry Potter. And, you know, like you said, that reminds me of that great saying something about, I think it applies to racism and all kinds of isms, but it's like, why be racist when you can just be quiet? JK Rowling, right? Why be transphobic quick and you could just not say anything? Just, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but is there, am I playing like the armchair psychologist? Or is there something about like an escape and a fantasy in, in reading, you know, being uh, new to the language, new to the culture, especially when you're seven, eight, nine years old? This idea of like reading as, as a refuge or a, a, an escape, not that, you know, not that down like, not that things were horrible for you, but just like, you know, these are these are some these are things that I know friends this is a, an escape I wonder if that's true to life for you yeah I think it was I um I didn't I mean I was not the best uh at making friends um in my youth and and I think like you know having a um or sort of challenge in like knowing written English really well, but not being able mm. to yeah. sort of pronounce all the words. Uh, Cause when you read a word, when you learn a word through reading, you don't know how to pronounce it. So you just sort of pronounce it in your head. Yes. And that doesn't lend itself to like friend making. <laughs> you don't know any of the slang. You don't know any of the, but like the, the right. fun pop culture or anything. You're like mm -hmm. this bookish nerd. <laughs> which somehow now is like a popular thing, which is sort of bizarre yeah, to me because I, yeah. you know, I grew up, <laughs> I grew, uh, yeah, growing up in the nineties, that was not a thing. If you were a nerd, you were an outsider <laughs> and there was no cool points uh, afforded to you as a nerd. 
No. Um, yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> it it was it was an escape. Um, I think you know I, I was really drawn to a lot of fantasy, a lot of um, sort of I, I loved those books. I forget what they're called, but like it was essentially a book series in which someone would relive the same day. It was like Groundhog Day. Like okay. someone would relive the same day every single day until yeah. they figured it out. Uh, and there was this whole series of those. And then there was um, sideways stories from Wayside School and mm -hmm. all of these sort of like fabulous, surreal right. stories. And that's what I loved. I loved sort of projecting myself into these worlds where I, I knew that um, I, that didn't exist, but that where I, where I had thought I might be better off. Yes. Tan tangentially related. Have you seen Severance on Apple TV? No. Oh my gosh. I've heard it about it. Oh my gosh. What a series. It's, you know, they call it a, they call it, I mean, it's a sci-fi it's, it's sci-fi, which is not normally mm -hmm. my bag. Man, it's good. Man. Huh. Yes. Okay. Check it out. But anyways, it reminded me of, you know, the fabulous, the, the, mm -hmm. the fantasy type of thing for sure. Um, did you, could you have articulated, I'm kind of skipping ahead. I didn't, I'm not really even asking the question first, but the question is, did you, did you feel a representation? Did you feel like you saw yourself in what you read growing up? In you know again yeah. in all the different no, <laughs> no period no. No, no no comma no, no period, period. Uh, well no semicolon maybe I don't <laughs> know um, no M -dash. I or M dash yeah no M dash um, I I definitely saw a sort of spunky feisty okay. um, female protagonist which mm -hmm. was really important to me. Um, there was a series about Cam, uh, who was who was a like an I don't know, probably twelve year old detective, oh, um, familiar, yeah. who like had a photographic memory. So like mm. all of the cases would involve some sort of um, Cam's remembering a photographic memory. Oh, I get it, Cam. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I get it. Yeah. Clever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but like it was those kinds of things that that really interested me. Like I loved Hermione from mm. Harry Potter. I just mm. I, I was like to see women being able to sort of project themselves out of the expectations that mm. were held for them was amazing. Okay. Um, but at the same time, like there were no brown people <laughs> in these in these stories. Um, there was definitely no South Asian representation mm. at all. Mm. And so like nothing I recognized, nothing that looked like my own life, nothing that um, reflected my own experiences as an immigrant, mm -hmm. nothing like that. And so um, it's it's always been like now lately, I've been getting into Kidlet, uh, mm -hmm. middle grade, YA, um, and, and part of my uh, journey and project, I guess, agenda is mm -hmm. to write the stories I needed to see, uh -huh. um, write the kind of representation I needed to have at, mm -hmm. at that age. Mm -hmm. And I wish that I had had at that age. Um, and, and I think, yeah, it did, definitely didn't exist in the 90s. Yeah, so um, I mean, I got to assume that's some some motivation to, I mean, as great as the work you do is like blue skin gods, that's, you know, more for the adults. Right. So I got it. That's probably been some motivation to write for younger readers because it's like, all right, if we don't get whatever the 12, the 16 year old, they may not become a 35 year old reader. Right. Is that kind mm -hmm. of fa fair to say? Yeah. Um, I think if you, if you don't provide mirrors when people are young, mm -hmm. they're not going to trust, um, the literary experience as yeah. they grow older. Yeah. Oh man, those great those great quotes about the mirrors and the windows, you know, with reading. That's awesome. Um, as you get in the as you got into high school, college, um, what were you reading? Did, did you know? Did you start to see and feel that representation 
um, whether they're immigrant stories, whether South Asian stories, whether, um, you know, all the different cultures that make us up, subcultures, who, who really uh, thrilled you as you got into high school and college and inspired you? Uh, in high school, I read um, one of the very first sort of South Asian novels that came across my my um, purview, I guess. Mm -hmm. It was uh, called Born Confused by okay. Tanuja Desai Hidier. And it was a YA sort of romance novel, but um, it was... I had never, I had never seen something like that before. Mm. Um, and it's still like Born Confused is still, I think, one of the first representations that that really broke through the publishing barrier um, mm. and, 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 and gave us the kind of sort of South Asian American experience uh -huh. um, in a novel where we got to, we got to be the main character. And that was amazing. Uh -huh. um, the other one was like Interpreter of Maladies by John Lahiri won the Pulitzer Prize uh, it was, it was at right. that it was time decent, too. It was a decent book, yeah, it was, it was all right. <laughs> <laughs> um, when I was in high school and I was like, oh, wow, okay. So we're really like, there's, there's starting to, there's a sea change happening. Mm -hmm. um, and I started to realize that, that um people that the publishing industry was paying attention to South Asian voices for maybe the first time. Mm. And I also started to think in, you know, my senior year that maybe I wanted to contribute to that. Oh, wow. So what was the moment or moments? What were the Eureka moments where you're like, you know, was, was it the fanfic? Was it something in a, in a, in a workshop? You, you talk about those, um, you know, like going into writing in college and man, we all remember those workshops, right? Those could be nerve wracking, but also like incredible victories, you know? So, so yeah, I mean, what, what was it? Or what, was there a moment or moments where you're just like, okay, I can do this for a living. People dig my work. I think there were several, there was definitely the, um, the time in, in 12th grade when uh, I read Tim O'Brien's The Things They Carried and I realized that, you know, I could maybe write about war because I was, you know, my, my childhood was spent, my early childhood was spent in the Sri Lankan Civil War and I was like, okay, I don't know how to make sense of these experiences. Mm -hmm. And having the things I left or, um, the things I carried right. as a model for how to write about war was really important to me. I was like, oh, wow, I've never seen such a lyrical, mm -hmm. nuanced, beautiful, complex uh, reflection on what war is. Mm -hmm. And I was like, OK, maybe I could do this. And then um, in college, I took a writing workshop with um, the writer Timothy Shaffert, and uh, we were in a basement in a windowless basement room. Um, <laughs> it was a night class. And I, like, I, I knew then sitting in that class that, that I, that's what I wanted. Mm. I wanted it so badly. I was mm. like, okay, here's a writer who is making it work. I mean, he's queer, he's in Nebraska and he's like writing these books and, and he's a full-time writer at this point. And, He's, um, you know, very soft-spoken, like very kindly, but very like astute in his feedback. Mm -hmm. And I had never had that kind of attention paid to my work before. Yeah. And I was like, okay, this is it. This is what I'm going to do. Mm. I can see my future and this is it. Did you hold a press so conference? So if you talk about her, huh? Did you hold a press conference? <laughs> yeah, well if you're talking well I did I I told I told my um because I was in a I was in this honors sort of computer science business mm -hmm. management program where you like it was like this whole deal and we had to like talk to people to actually get out of it and uh, so yeah it was sort of I had to like go through <laughs> all these steps and I had to inform my parents yeah. and um that was that did not go very well um so yeah it was it was a whole ordeal 
Well, well, where did the, how did the encouragement keep coming? Was it mostly, you know, self, was it mostly self-motivation for a while? Um, you know, how did you, how did you keep going when it was difficult? You had to change majors. You had to maybe, maybe you displeased a couple people. How did, how did you keep going with it? You know, what were maybe some of the early publications too, that kind of thing? Um, it was mostly professors, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, I had a lot of self-doubt. I didn't really know what I was doing. Um, and in high school, I had uh, I took environmental science, and uh, we went to this um, this swamp as a field trip, and we had to write field journals. And I wrote this field journal, and I turned it in. And my environmental science uh, teacher, who it was AP environmental science in 12th grade and he was like his only response was you should consider being a writer mm. and I was like oh interesting okay I, mm. I I I really for some reason that really sort of lodged itself in my brain mm -hmm. um and then you know Tim Schaffer with whom I took that class and almost every writing professor I had at the University of Nebraska was so so uh encouraging that's cool um, they, they just were like, you, you can make it, mm -hmm. you can do it if you wanted to, mm -hmm. why don't you do it? Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, maybe. Okay. All right, fine. I, I, I think I can do it. Um, mm -hmm. so it was really just my professors who, who were <laughs> very, very, um, not just encouraging, but also like very supportive and yeah. they lent me their time and they read my work outside of class hours and yeah they were just really really generous wow very cool how did how did the the you know i guess the fairly short writing how did that you know turn into to books and and you know i'd love to hear about marriage of a thousand lies which was you know which is heavily awarded it wasn't like some like ah oh, my first book is thrown out in the world like it it got a lot of praise um you know what was kind of like the the genesis of marriage of a thousand lies i it started off as a short story. Um, I was in, I was starting my master's program at the University of Nebraska and I was like, okay, I don't really know what I'm doing. I was like 20 years old and I really had no idea. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was like, okay, let's just take this class. And it was a, it was a novel class with um, Janice A.G., who's a, a very accomplished novelist. And she was basically like, okay, take the short story, whatever short story has been, has been sort of, sort of still like has its claws in you okay. after you wrote it and make it into a novel. And I was like, okay, all right. There was a story that, that kept bothering me after I wrote it. I was like, it just kept, it couldn't, I couldn't get it out of my head. And so I started turning it into a novel in that class and it turned into, <laughs> it turned into Marriage for a Thousand Lies. It was my thesis mm. for my master's program. And then um, I, then I took two years uh, off um, of school and uh, I worked and I did all sorts of weird jobs. <laughs> and at the same time, I, I um, revised the novel and it was, mm. It was a really, it was a time when I learned a lot about who I was as a writer, but also who I, who I am as a person. Yeah. <laughs> um, and it was, yeah. it was, it, it was really nice. It was really nice. That's really cool. Do the, do the, are those weird jobs going to find their way into your writing down the road or have they already? Maybe I haven't okay. actually, I, I was a proofreader for Pearson. Um, Pearson uh, is, huh. is the company that owns uh, Penguin Random House. And, um, but Pearson actually does the the educational stuff, so right. uh, they publish the textbooks. Yes. Um, and I was a proofreader, and it was it was this really weird, wild environment. Uh, <laughs> all the proofreaders uh, hung out and played board games during lunch, and it was yeah, it was really interesting. Um, <laughs> I I want to write about that <laughs> at yeah. some point. Yeah. Well, I, I, I have only good things to say about the Pearson textbooks I've used as a teacher over the years. So thank you, you yeah. know, good stuff. And all that was done, you know, over board games. Okay, cool. <laughs> blue skin, blue skin gods is the one we're going to talk mostly about. And um, wow. What an accomplishment. Um, it's, uh, it's current. 
you know, it's one of those that, you know, has, you know, apps and, and you know, dating apps and, and technology and stuff, but it's not dated. Um, even, I love to ask you about like kind of the first part of the book, which takes place back in India, kind of like what years maybe you picture those as being or whether that matters or not, you know. Um, but anyways, I just, I love to know, and I, I sometimes ask the, the writers to give a summary and the book, I mean, I guess you could, but it's like, there's so many cool ins and outs and we want to stay away from plot spoilers because those twists. But I guess, again, what was the, the genesis of that? Um, it's steeped in mythology and more, you know, religious, um, you know, texts. I would love to know where, where that came from. Again, Maybe it was a short story. <laughs> Um, it was a short story that was trying to explore um, religiosity because this was like 2013. It was a time when Hindu fundamentalism was on the rise in India. And I, yeah. I, I, I found that really weird and interesting because I, in Sri Lanka, I had been persecuted and we had been persecuted as a family for being Hindu. So it was really interesting to me uh, you know, in a bad way, uh, that sure. Hindus in India were persecuting other religious minorities. Um, so I started researching it and I started talking about it and thinking about it. And, um, and then I read these headlines about um, fake gurus and all these cults that, that were happening in India. Uh, you know, Bikram yoga was a thing. Oh, man. And yeah like uh there was just so many and I saw some of my friends get like lured into some of the stuff mm. and I really wanted to write about it I really did mm. and so I I wrote this short story um that was sort of magical realist in that you know the, the instead of having blue skin the central character grows wings um. and once he grows wings uh, there's this belief in his village that if you have a feather, if you're bestowed with a feather from his wings, you will be healed of any ailment. Mm. And at the end of the story, spoiler, whatever, um, <laughs> he, this like mob sort of converges on him and plucks his wings. Um, they just like pluck, you know, keep plucking until he yeah. has no feathers anymore. Yeah. And I loved that, that sort of, uh, uh, bringing together religiosity, but also violence, because I think those yeah. two are sometimes very intricately linked. Um, sure. yeah, so word, yeah, that's the word fanaticism, right? I mean, fanaticism. Yes, can be. Yeah, the, I was I was just rereading part of the book where um, uh, just the just the idea of I, I think when uh, when you know when his cousin leaves, this idea of like that sadness that becomes in in the religious text became anger you know where, like his dad was like mm -hmm. hey stop crying and he's like well that would that happened in the text too and it was it was often a you know huge smoldering anger now he probably would have been sued by the marquez estate though right maybe gabriel garcia marquez estate might have sued i mean i mean like <laughs> he doesn't own the wings, right right, right? In, right so <laughs> exactly you're right you're right I'm, I'm just kidding um would would the would somebody would somebody who read has read blue skin gods recognize that like did that like directly go into the book even though it wasn't the wings or was it like you just no no kind of a general idea i just i really just took the wings and only the wings from okay. from okay. that story um so i don't i don't think so i don't think okay. so <laughs> okay um obviously you know it's called blue skin gods and blue is described in the book and just in general knowledge is you know it's being warm and flame can also be cold mm -hmm. right um and i wonder about the title did the title come right away or was it more like the events of the book and then the title came later which informed which you know, I guess, or maybe both it really like it really depends on the book so like for this book losing god's I had the title before I even started writing okay. and knew what it was going to be called. Um, I, and like on the first draft, I put blue skin to gods. Um, uh, Marriage of a Thousand Lies did not work that way. That was actually a title. It, it went through like five or six different titles. Whoa. 
and um marriage of a thousand lives was like the last title i slapped on it before i sent it to an agent mm. honestly like it was just <laughs> i was like i need a title they're probably going to change it later i'll just put this on there right. and then when they didn't change it later i was kind of upset i was like oh no <laughs> this is the title <laughs> yeah oh, man it worked it worked <laughs> did um you know, obviously there's, there's a lot of parallels of religious texts with the blue skin. We'll talk about in a second. I don't know how you pronounce it. The Fugate, the Fugati family, like in Kentucky. I think it's Fugates. Fugate. Okay. This, these are real, these were real blue skin people. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and so I wonder about like research you did both on like the, the religious texts and like, you know, the American example and, and uh, I'm going to have you, uh, say the word please because the uh the name of the illness or the name of the i want to say maybe it starts with an m do you I, I, <laughs> yeah it's methemoglobinemia thank you so yeah any, you know research i mean was it like when you know did you did you find out about the fugate family later or was it like oh my gosh and that kind of really propelled the story forward it was, it was the second, like, I, I, I knew that I wanted, um, a sort of, uh, a, a kid who was being forced into this, this title as a guru to mm -hmm. lead, uh, lead a people and maybe heal a people. Right. And then I, and then I like, sort of, like smashed it with the, uh, my research on the Fugate family, yeah. uh, where, you know, this like extremely recessive gene had produced actual blue skinned people. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I like smooshed these two ideas together and, mm -hmm. and got this <laughs> novel. <laughs> I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the, about Vishnu and, and the, like the blue skinned Hindu God. I don't know if he was the only one or others who I think were represented as blue skinned. A lot of Hindu gods are are depicted as blue skinned, okay. um, but as as my protagonist Kalki says, you know we don't really know why that is. It might be because um, there were a lot of gods in indigenous Indian you know, uh, belief that were really dark skinned, mm. um, reflecting the skin color of the people that that lived there. Mm. Um, and then eventually when, you know, we know that there were several rounds of migrations, um, each sort of lightning in color because the original migrations, which formed the basis of the Tamil people mm -hmm. were very dark skinned. It was very early on out of Africa and the kind of Indian people that we, that we like have now associated with India with like, sort of golden caramel skin and mm -hmm. and uh, you know that like the Priyanka Chopra type of people came much later mm -hmm. right they they came from um Central Asia rather than like straight out of Africa right. so there's like different gene pools we're working with mm -hmm. and the idea is that you know the the lighter skinned people who took over most of India were not uh, thrilled about these super, super dark skinned indigenous gods. And so when they absorbed them into the pantheon, these gods became blue skinned mm. because it was better than being dark skinned. Right. Um, so it was really a, 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 a um, an act of colorism to, mm. to change from dark skin to blue skin. Sure. Wow. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Um, so there's Kalki Sami, am I saying that correctly? Yeah, you're actually okay. doing really good on the pronunciation. I appreciate that. <laughs> I, I did my homework, you know. Um, you know, is, is the main character seen as this reincarnation of, as another avatar, is that safe to say? Yeah. Right? Yeah. And, you know, through the prophecies and the religious texts. And now, here, here I go again, is the stress on the last letter. So Aya for the father? Aya. Okay. Aya. Yeah. yeah. Equals okay. equal stress. Okay. Oh, I see. Okay. Because in Espanol, Aya is like over there. Aya. Aya. Right. Mm. So he's he's the exploiter, right? He's he's mm -hmm. a doctor who I believe who spent some time in the US before, right? Before mm -hmm. moving back, right? And he's 
you know, towards the beginning, you don't necessarily see him as a hundred percent conniver. At least I didn't, um, you know, but he, but, but you get some clues, right? There's uh there's an article in the local paper, you know, and he talks about, this is exactly the exposure we need. Um, you know, just being very extremely secretive to say the least. I don't want to, you know, blow one of the huge secrets at, at the end. He's crafty. He's craven. He, we later, I mean, he's, he's, he treats uh, his wife horribly. Um, the, when, when Kalkisami gets to be 10, he has a major test of his miracles, right? He kind of helped to heal people kind of, and there was really kind of plausible deniability, right? Whether, yes, he did. Yes, he did. You could, you know, um, tell us a little bit about Rupa and how she was like a test for him. And then later how she became part of his life. So Kelki, when he's 10, he's supposed to get these three tests um, to right. prove that he is in fact the uh, second coming, I, wrote the, I guess the 10th coming of sure. Vishnu. Sure. And um, so Rupa is the first test. So she is a very sickly girl who is brought to the ashram where Kaki is and and like you know the hospitals don't know what to do with her the clinics the doctors that they have seen like can't fix her illness she's basically whittling away she's mm -hmm. sort of skin and bones when she meets Kaki um and he is in charge of healing her that's his first test and so like he is this enormous burden on a 10 year old right and he's, you know, he's trying everything he can think of. And, mm -hmm. and there is something that goes a little bit awry with her healing in that um, her, her, his aunt feeds her something while he's watching. Um, and then as soon as he feeds her something, she starts to get better. And so Kalki starts to doubt his own divinity. But then he has two, these two other tests that he needs to pass. And he mm -hmm. seems to pass the second test just fine. Um, the third test goes terribly and he ends up you know losing part of his family um but then like rupa is given to the ashram which is it is a fairly normal practice for when you know somebody is healed in that kind of miraculous way okay. um where she's sort of promised to the mm -hmm. ashram in the way that like young women were promised to uh monasteries or nunneries in right, the past right, right. Um, so she's given to the ashram and she sort of grows up along with Kalki and when, when he's a teenager, he starts to fall in love with her um, and she becomes his, his first love. For sure. Um, and then, so we have Lakshman, I, I call him the frenemy cousin, uh, <laughs> <laughs> right? Uh, you know, they're, they're kids together, they play fight, you know, there's Rupa as, at the third wheel or... Mm -hmm right or this idea of like, like you know like a love triangle maybe you know and the same you know mm -hmm. as kids would have um and you know and they have great times together as well and but there's, you know there's also like the bathing incident right where was it maybe maybe the mom was out of town or something like that mm -hmm. and, right and so Kalki is is bathing and there's that whole process that mom had done with you know, to keep the the water blue and you know and Lakshman is asking the same questions that we're probably asking his reader, like, how do you, what's, what's natural, what's not, and all that. But also you, you do a, a really a great job in connecting the Lakshman and, and Kalki um, relationship with, what would that be, Rama and Vishnu? Mm -hmm. Right? And so we'll talk about the parallels there, if you would, about, you know, who was the helper, who was the god, and I mean, we know that, but how mm -hmm. they were, how they were connected. Yeah, it's uh, Rama and, and Lakshman. So Rama is the eighth incarnation or seventh incarnation of Vishnu and um, it is the, the biggest like sort of, so he's the hero of the Ramayana, which is one of right. the big Sanskrit epics. And um, Ram's younger brother is named Lakshman and he is like Ram's most, most devoted brother. He is the only brother who follows Ram into the woods after he is exiled from his kingdom. He's the only brother who's like 
you know, willing to wage war on behalf of Ram at the end. You know, there's only one instance in which they fight, and this comes up in the book as well. But so uh, Ram is the hero, or Ram is the god, and Lakshman is portrayed as the hero. And in the Mahabharata, it is very similar, where Krishna is the god and Arjun is the hero. Arjun is uh, sort of, you know, Krishna's very devoted friend. Um, they're not actually related, but they're, but they're very good friends and yeah. they, they, they remain so until the very end. Um, so there's this like sort of relationship um, predicted in these texts. And uh -huh. so these two boys fashion themselves and their own relationship from these texts because they that's what they've been told mm -hmm. uh and so kalki is a little bit older not very much older they're basically the same age but kalki is like a few months older right and 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 he's you know maybe a year older and he's mm -hmm. he's sort of decided that he is um he is the leader but he's he's not a very good leader he doesn't have any of like leader you know any of the leadership qualities we would expect but Lakshman does he is charismatic he's funny he's mm -hmm. good looking he can sort of like predict what people need to hear and what people want to hear at a particular moment whereas Kalki is sort of awkward and bookish right so I I wanted to create that imbalance in that Lakshman is much better suited to this role that yeah. Kalki has been given Very true. um and so because of that he gets really jealous mm -hmm. and you know they're they're nine and ten years old of course they you know of course Lakshman would get jealous and so I wanted to sort of explore this this friendship and this deep camaraderie mm. with this imbalance in power and imbalance in situation right ah oh, very interesting I'm I'm reminded in a really great way of um, of Amir and Hassan from the Kite Run. I don't know if you've read the Kite oh, Run. Yes, I have. I have. Right, Hassan. Hassan. Sorry, sorry, sorry. But yeah, yeah, there's there's with Hassan. You know, he doesn't have that. What you're talking about? He doesn't have that jealousy. He's like right. incredibly innocent. And but but I see a lot of that. You know, there there's that imbalance that always comes between like that's not the right, but like, you know, like a boss and a worker, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Like as much as they're, they're related or they're friends, it's like, it's, you know, so that's, uh, but that's a great um, comparison. And that was a really great relationship. But like you talk about Lakshman is such a charismatic guy. You might even say a rock star. We'll get to that, <laughs> we'll get to that right? Um, such a cool narrative structure. The, the flash forwards, the flashbacks, um, Man, I got that thrill when I was reading the book and I was like, whoa, this was written by Kalki later as a professor. Like this, like he wrote this book, right? Mm -hmm. S.J. Sindhu may be on the cover, but this is really, you know what I mean? <laughs> um, and just like the fact that he was so much steeped in religion as a kid. Yes, it was a fake religion. Yes, it was cultish. Yes, it was, but he was so, that was his life. And then in the end, he's really just, disabuse disabuse of that notion i don't think i've ever said that mm -hmm. that phrase in my life that i use it right disabuse of the notion you know of religion <laughs> is positive right because religion was obviously uh, was a very detrimental um, part of his life but it's just so cool mm -hmm. i wonder how you were able to get in the mind of the 10 15 17 year old kalki and also the you know whatever 40 year old or you know how much how over old he was as a professor I, you know, I, I lost my faith when I was fairly young, um, mm -hmm. but I think for sure when by the time I was 16, 17, I was starting to be like, okay, atheism, mm -hmm. I want to research this because mm -hmm. I, I think this is what I believe. Um, and so I think for me, I was sort of, I was trying to channel that he's a little late, like yeah. in that he's 22 right. when he really, you know, walks away. Um, but like, I remember being 22. I remember mm -hmm. that, like, who am I stage in your life where you're trying to really mm -hmm. understand, um, what you believe and, and, um, 
what is, go- you know, what you want your life to look like. Um, and then, you know, the, the middle-aged Kalki is sort of me right now being like, okay, <laughs> I can, I can, I can deal with Kalki right now. Like where, mm-hmm. where he's, he's sort of my age when he's writing this novel sure. and, and, and the moment I figured it out that it was Kalki's like faux memoir, um, mm. that was a huge moment in mm. revising the novel. I, I was lost. I was like, why am I writing this? What's the exigence? Like, you know, mm. what, what, is, what am I doing? Mm-hmm. What is this? Mm-hmm. And then, you know, we, uh, my partner and I were on a hike in Cherokee, North Carolina. And I like walked onto the hiking path and I was like, oh my God, it's a faux memoir. He, Kalki is writing his own memoir and that's mm-hmm. the book. And that changed everything. It changed okay. everything. It, it allowed me to return to the novel with a new, um, with a new agenda of revision. Okay. And that's, that is what ended up becoming the final version. Right, 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 right. And so cool. So the, um, gosh, dang it. I, I, I always forget this term, but the idea, what, in the, the Latin term, but you started in the middle in some ways, right? The book starts with that, the, the after effects of that, of the, the auto rickshaw accident. And it's like, mm-hmm. all right, all right, Kalki, do your thing, right? And you do such a good job, of, again, of the back and forth. And that comes up again later in the book. I'm always a fan of that. Like, oh, okay, now this has a different meaning than it did at the beginning, right? But also just like getting inside the head of somebody who kind of believes that he's a god and can be pushed either way. And like you said, you know, he does okay on some of the miracles, even the ones where people don't help him out by giving them medicine. Like he kind of channels something and he's just kind of maybe like a positive energy, whatever, and it kind of mm-hmm. works, right? So it's just really well mm-hmm. done with the way that we go back and forth. And like I said, we get the different perspectives, the middle-aged Kalki, the young, um, and even the omniscient at times, right? And so it's not exactly broken in half the book, but there is this idea of like a common era, you know, BC, AD, CE, mm-hmm. BCE, of like him going to New York is, you know, changes the whole, the whole book to be, you know, obviously, right. His faith is tested even more. He definitely does not get along well with his father <laughs> in New York. <laughs> I think it was, I think it was father sitting at the bar waiting to, to accost him, you know, that kind of thing. But I want to talk more about the themes of faith. Um, back in India, when, um, you know, when Kalki was still seen as a God of some sort, Sita comes as a guest and I thought she was a really interesting um, character she's kind of uh, she's uh, I think she I think you might have literally had her wearing pants right she's she's uh she's not you know she's a woman's in the term back in the the old-fashioned term she's women's lib she's you know forward Mm -hmm. thinking right she (laughs) she doesn't have any man tell her what to do she's very independent um kind of you know, probably coming from a richer family, it sounds like, right? Mm-hmm. I'm kind of mm-hmm. like, what? I'm kind of like, what was she doing there? Was she there for just like rest and relaxation? Um, but anyways, she brings books with her. And whether we're talking about literally a religious faith or just like getting to know the world, right? Because Kalki lived in such a sheltered, protected environment by his dad who wanted to keep his investment, right? What a cool character. I wonder where you know, where Sita came in and, you know, where you put her in the narrative, like, was she someone you wanted to have right away? Or how did that work? I wanted someone to introduce the world to Kelki Mm -hmm. in a way that didn't take him out of the ashram quite yet, because he needed to stay in the ashram for longer for Mm -hmm. his, for his arc to, to actually work. Um, But I wanted him to have connections with the outer world and so that's kind of how Sita started is that I wanted I wanted a person who could introduce Kaki Mm -hmm. to the bigger questions of the world and and specifically through literature because I was you know I was in the middle of my PhD at this point and and I was like okay I'm reading all this stuff I I, you know my own mind is being broken and 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 Mm -hmm. broken open Sure. And, and expanded and I wanted to give that 
to my main character. Um, and, and so that's kind of what Sita was at the beginning. Um, and then I also wanted, um, I was very aware that, you know, I'm, uh, it's me writing this young brown boy and um, this young Tamil boy. And I wanted to create female characters, women characters in, in the book, femme characters who are going to not fit the traditional notions of yeah. women or, or what women's role is within a male story. So essentially, mm-hmm. like at the end, this is still Kathy's story, but I wanted to make sure that that the women around him were unusual mm-hmm. and exceptional. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, while his mother was under the thumb of his father, she was a she was an exceptional character. She was she was a great mm-hmm. artist. She was a beautiful artist. She you know she didn't always follow the rules. She didn't always follow conventions. She would take him into the town to make the phone calls and kind of like. But but dad was gonna say, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Right. She was very independent in her own ways. Um, and obviously you know a lot of the depression came from just being treated so horribly. Um, but you know Sita you have as the window to the outside world. Like you said, she traveled. And she brings him Chopin, Chopin's the the awakening, right? So it's mm-hmm. you know it's truly an awakening to him. Like whoa, there's so much out there to see. And like you say, it's kind of a it's like a precursor to his New York trip, right? Like, okay, I'm mm-hmm. still here in the ashram, but it's it's planting those seeds down the road. Another theme of the, of the book is you know sickness comes in so many forms. This idea of like the the the, the mind and body connection, right? Um, like a, almost like a panacea type thing or placebo, excuse me, right? Exploitation and selfishness. Did you, for the character of Aya, like, did you, who's the exploiter, did you look more specifically at like religious um, charlatans or did you look more at like a Trump, like political or all of the above? Well, both. I mean, I had no idea that when this book came out, Trump would be president. Like I could right? never have predicted man, this man. because when I was writing it, I mean, Trump was <laughs> like, he was a joke. He wasn't that was win. not no, that. Not yeah. Really he was a joke. Yeah. Um, and so like the, the seeds of Aya took place before any of that happened. Yeah. Uh, and and I think like later on, as Trump assumed the presidency, and as you know, I, I think I I think I sold the novel in 2019, so he'd mm-hmm. been president for about three months or three years. Um, I don't know. Time is time is weird right, right. now. Yes. Uh, <laughs> but uh, he had been president for three years, and and I sort of like. I shifted Aya's character to include some of the stuff, oh, that, some sure. of the Trumpian things. Sure. But it, originally, he started off as um, as as modeled after the charlatans that had existed. So the the people who had sort of brought um, not just in Hindu cults and in Hindu like sort of guru following, mm-hmm. but also like. Um, like Scientology and yes, other yes, yes, kinds yes. of, um, you know, cult, modern day cults that, mm-hmm. that we've seen come, come through. Mm-hmm. I, I studied cult leaders and what they were like and, and, and the kinds of things that they actually believed. Right. Um, and I think, you know, I, I made a decision early on that like Aya was going to be a full believer. Like he's going to believe that he is right. That that Kalki is the the last incarnation of Vishnu, and that that mm-hmm. that this is going to bring peace to the world. Mm-hmm. Like that is a foundational belief that Aya has that it needed needed to be in order to write his character. Like he believes that he is correct, mm-hmm. not yeah. just in like a not just in like a like a this is good for Kalki way, but in a this is good for the world, and I. Um, a, a maverick to profit way. Mm-hmm. Yes, he you know he's not a morally good character, but what a well drawn character! Like he's, I mean, he could easily have been like a uh, a stereotype or a you know what's the word? Just like an overdone character. 
because there are there are some like that, right? Like, oh, you know, the world needs mm -hmm. this, but it doesn't know it. I'm in here to give it, you know, that kind of thing. But yeah, he just the way that you draw the character is, is so well done because it's not he's not he's he's fleshed out. He's not a he's not like a simplistic character for sure. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I I I don't know. I I believe there's probably a part of him that's like you know, this is good for them, right? We're helping mm -hmm. them, you know, whether it's a placebo or not, that kind of thing. Um, sounds good. <laughs>